Delighted to have everyone on tonight. Uh, as a follow up to our first one um, on the relative age effects that we had led by Jamie Queenie from from uh, from Meath, uh, County Games Manager in Meath. We're focusing on zooming in on growth and maturation this evening. Um, it is very much as Des and Fionn will allude to an awareness workshop or awareness seminar, if you like, um, just to provide some insights around some some really good quality research and anecdotes and stories that are happening uh, in certain parts of the country at both club and county level. I suppose just to share or reshare the, the purpose of these these uh, these seminars, these sessions, it, it is to share back insights, clubs, schools, counties and provinces to help support and better inform what's happening um, on the ground in coach and player development. Um, Fionn, we're delighted to have Fionn Fitzgerald, a lecturer in MTU Kerry, PhD candidate and SNC coach with us this evening. He's a member of the Athletic Development Working Group in uh, the Gaelic Games Sports Science Working Group. And also uh, privileged to have Des Ryan, Director of Commons at Tanta College, joining us all the way from uh, the United States. Uh, Des, Des has been the lead of the Athletic Development Working Group uh, in, in the Sports Science Working Group uh, for the last uh, 18 months. And there are some other members of, of the group on as well, uh, which is great, including Sean Cummings. So we, we appreciate everyone's uh, support. Uh, my name is Martin Kennedy and I work in uh, coach and player development within the GA uh, at present. So what are we trying to do? Well, we're zooming in at the, this particular part of our player pathway, the new player pathway. We're really trying to bring it to life. Yes, we feel you'll hear insights from Fionn around, I suppose, the development squad area T1 and T2 in particular. But we're also going to have references and some stories and maybe some data and insights to share from Des in F3 Youth. Uh, at the club end of the pathway as well. So just trying to cover those two parts of it. I think this is important. Uh, the, the Talent Academy and Player Development uh, report was published. A lot of hard work by a lot of people uh, led by Brian Cuthbert, Michael Dempsey, Shane Flanagan, and a lot of other very good people uh, put this together. It's been in place since 20, 2019, 2020. I suppose I'm conscious of just keeping referencing back to it and, and uh, looking back at what the key recommendations are. And two of them in particular, which we're trying to bring to light here, uh, are the relative age effects, which Jamie covered and we'll allude to briefly here, but now we're tonight we're looking at growth and maturation and also linking that into coach education and coach development. So important that these reports don't just, you know, gather dust on a, on a shelf, that we, we, we continue to look back at them and, and what were the key findings and, and recommendations and trying to put some actions in place uh, to help coaches and players on the ground day to day. Uh, again, just to, to reshare, uh, there is a, a coach pathway and a new learning space that has been and is being built and developed in the background. Uh, and, and tonight is an example of uh, what, what will be in time an education offering um, around possibly growth and maturation and how to do that and how to deliver that within a club environment and perhaps even build, building communities of practice around what good and could and should look like. So this is the this is the bird's eye view of what the new learning space looks like and a lot of some of this is happening as you can see uh, at the moment through conferences through the introduction of culture Gaelic games etc. Um, but we're just trying to put more meat on the bones uh, week in week out um, and, and communicate same to, to everyone. So. Without further ado, um, can I hand over to, to Fionn, please, to, to introduce the piece from yourself? Yes. Thank Love you very that. much. Um, so first of all, thanks, Martin, and to uh, for the first of all to for the opportunity to present some of our uh, our research here, and secondly, I suppose thanks to all the coaches um, who are following now and maybe looking back at the recording in time. So as Martin alluded to, there's there's a little bit in this air in this topic that we'd like to cover. There's quite a bit we'd like to cover. But it's today is a little bit more of a an awareness um, an awareness presentation, and at the same time, a kind of a whistle top tour of the whole a aspect or area of growth and maturation. Um, so I'm going to present a little bit, and then Des is going to present. Okay, here we go. So I'm just going to introduce a little bit around the topic of growth and maturation. So what it's all about, the, I suppose, the relevance to us as coaches are maybe involved in coach education. Um, it's important that we introduce the, the background, the topic. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit of research I would have done in my P or that I'm currently in the middle of in my PhD. Um, the initial findings I think that are quite useful to all coaches on the ground 
um, at a, a county level is, is what I'm looking at a development squad level but most certainly we'll discuss the club setting as well uh, and there's some context there but this has the uh, has the ability to be fed right down to, to club level and grassroots level. Um, so then Dez is going to speak a little bit about his um, background in Arsenal and it has a lot of practical stories around maturation and um, very interesting stuff that they would have done on a, 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 at a in a professional context, but like a lot of learnings for us as well um, in, a, in a GA context too. And we'll come back around for, for the practical implications. There will be a little bit of talking obviously around what we found so far, but it's important that I discuss where my research is going and where maybe some other counties have done some really good interesting work in the area. So I know there's there's a there's green shoots uh, in different areas uh, or different counties around the place in relation to this whole concept of growth and maturation. So to get the ball rolling, I'm going to just play a quick video and um, hopefully it'll work now. Um, just going to play this for two seconds. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. I think you get the, the gist of, of what's going on here. Um, look, I suppose I, wa I wanted to put that video in, or I've seen it used previously. It's a, an interesting one to, to look at from the point of view of, a lot of us can probably relate to that, maybe not to the, to the extent to that with video now, but I'll be at a different sport. The whole idea really is um, around different uh, children and youths develop at their own rate. OK, everyone develops at their own rate. Uh, I have a couple of photographs here that maybe might be of interest. The top photograph here is actually, I came across this recently, Paddy McBrearty and Ryan McHugh. So that's at club level. Um, so quite a, quite a contrast there in relation to the two lads that are playing on the same team in the same age group. Um, Des may be familiar with the bottom photograph, the Arsenal photograph there. It's a, just a normal chronological game. Um, you have you've a real men versus boys type of a scenario after the game, shaking hands and there's the ball right keen in the middle of the other photograph. So like there's a load of photographs I could I could show and try and maybe bring to life. Des has some really interesting ones, but th this this photograph in the middle, I think, can, can kind of help frame where we're going with for the rest of this presentation. So you have your two eyes and you have the iceberg effect and that's used in loads of different uh, walks of life in different ways. But how this is, I think, quite relevant and interesting is Sometimes what the coach sees um, in, as potential at the start are, are, is very much based on what's, what's a current performance level. So in that scenario there, you're watching the rugby game. You, you can see this guy dominating the game. OK, he's obviously much, much further in his uh, maturity status, we'll say, than a lot of the other kids. And it's going to have a significant effect on, on performance. That's often how, unfortunately, even though we might be aware of people growing at different rates and developing at different rates. That's that's the way a lot of sport, particularly at a higher level, tends to go, where we're naturally biased towards um, looking at players who are maybe a little bit more advanced in their maturity. So the, that kind of top aspect is what you see and what you don't see. The, the top part is what I would consider almost like chronological age. So someone's born and they're playing under 14, whereas beneath the surface might be someone who has the body of a 10 year old. OK, or, and someone else might be the body of a 16 or 17 year old. So you're, you're just there's there's a lot we can discuss around this, but I wanted to kind of set the scene or the context as coaches. You have significant effect and role on how a lot of players maybe are selected um, and how their initial journey is, is started in relation to, to sport. And I think that we understanding a lot around growth and maturation is, is a, an important part. So the Superman concept is, you know, we can probably all relate to players um, in the earlier years uh, at the, from that perspective. Um, before I go any further, just to differentiate, Jamie did a brilliant presentation a few weeks ago on relative age effects. So I will touch a little bit on it today, but it's not the main focus for, for what I'm looking at. But essentially, relative age effect is, let's say we'll use under 14 as an example again, someone who's born earlier in the year, um, we'll say January uh, versus December, Traditionally, there's a, a bias towards uh, players born earlier in the year. 
OK, and um, I suppose the big point, the big message I would have in re relation to relative age effect in comparison to maturation is that age effects tend to be there from a very, very early age. So from like primary school level, basically, um, and in there it's it's relevant to a load of different contexts, be it all the way up to business and time um, in, in a sport educational context, very a load of different aspects. On the other side, biological maturation or maturation, which is progressing or advancing towards um, adulthood. So a child um, progressing towards adulthood, it, it comes in many different forms. You have, you could have your, your um, dental maturation, sexual maturation, um, but biological maturation is one of the ones that we're, we particularly are interested in when we're, when we're concerned with growth or maturation in sport. And the one that we particularly work, work towards is the idea of predicted adult height. Um, using one of the methods that I'll discuss in a second. Um, so in other words, where they're at in relation to their predicted adult height. Um, the big message, I suppose, in relation to maturation, how it's particularly important um, around in, in males around the age of 14, is that maturation kicks in particularly at puberty. Um, and you'll see a huge um, maybe change and so on in, in, in uh, the makeup, I suppose, of players and, uh, and what goes on from there. So maturation and relative age to begin with they're they're two different concepts and often they may be they they, they kind of get pulled into the one idea that someone who's born later in the year um is less advanced and someone who's born at start of the year is more advanced in, in in maturation and that's not necessarily how it works and i'll give you a couple of examples um of that as we go along okay um so mat maturation at around 14 15 that type of age 13 to 15 tends to become far greater um then we'll say something like relative age, which is present all the way through. OK, um, so this is the only we'll say sciencey slide I'll use, but it's it's quite simple if you look at it. These are a number of different boys and what it's showing basically is their famous growth spurt, OK, also known as peak height velocity. So you'll, you'll see that there's a huge variation in this um, group of boys on your you'll have your reds, which are your early your early um, maturing players. And you have your greens and your blues as your as your on time and and late. And essentially, what you can see is those in red there. There's one guy around maybe 10 and a half, 11 years of age. So he's going through his growth spurt very, very early. Probably a little bit like the guy we just saw in the the video at the start. Whereas you have other guys maybe going through that growth spurt around five years later. So that men versus boys type of concept. You can you can see now how that uh, begins to make sense and plays out. So essentially, like the changes in the body that goes on during puberty um, is significant, but this during this uh, period of, of growth, this rapid period of growth is, is very, very significant. And I think you'll be able to relate to maybe some of the side effects and so on soon. Um, so essentially what you find in this peak height velocity scenario, this this famous growth spurt, initially your player will will, will lengthen, OK, or he'll, 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 he'll grow longer at the start and then he will um, he'll start to fill out of afterwards. So normally about six months afterwards, starts to fill out and, and that's a uh, that's normally quite obvious just to caveat this with anyone who's working with females what happens in the female body is quite different um in peak height velocity so a male goes through it on average about 13 and a half or 14 years of age whereas a female goes through it a little bit earlier about 12 to 11 and a half um, and that's why you often see males and females playing together up to around those ages and the changes that occur in a male and female body are very different um hence maybe that that, that, that they're not involved or playing at a competitive level as much after that. OK, so these are maybe some of the some of the guys you can relate to um, when when a when a player or a group of players maybe are going through um, through peak height velocity. And I'm going to discuss a few of these here now in a second. So without going into incredible detail, some of the effects in relation to growth spurt are very much um, individual to every person, but Essentially, if you're increasing in uh, testosterone, which is like a homemade version of steroids, really, um, and it's going to cause a huge increase in height, weight, muscle mass, um, etc. And the, you're going to see things like, you know, rapid growth uh, injuries, um, maybe loss of coordination, huge increases in strength and um, and uh, and power, and ultimately maybe, you know, a, a lot of psychological or um, emotional type of um, issues as well potentially okay so I'm going to move on and explain a little bit about 
what we're doing. So as I said, it's a whistle tap tour of the basics there. We're going to talk a little bit about what we what we looked at. So using two carry two academies, Kerry and Cork, um, we wanted to understand so there's a lot of research done in the likes of the Premier League. So Sean is on this evening, they would have done a lot of work um or in, in a lot of the professional clubs in, in England. And Des will be quite familiar with this as well. And you know, there is a significant a, a relative age effect and, and maturation bias or maturity bias. So we wanted to see is is that uh, maturity bias uh, similar in uh, in Gaelic terms as well. And I know another a couple of other counties are starting to do this as well, which is brilliant. So we got players' heights and weights, and their parents' um, heights. Okay, and we're using that information and um, and, and a particular equation we use called Camus Roach uh, Camus Roach method. We were able to predict uh, where players are at in their um, where they're at in their in their stage of development. So from the point of view of predicted adult height is the is the me metric or measure we used for this. Um, so we had over 250 players from under 14 to under 16. So we had nine teams. So we had quite a good uh, uh, data set to work from. So getting straight to the the probably the the meat of what we're looking at here. There's a major maturity bias. Okay, so there's no getting away from this. It's quite consistent what you see in soccer. But in in normal population, you're talking about maybe 30, uh, sorry, 15% early maturing and 15% late maturing, uh, and roughly 65 to 70% on time. What we found in Kerry and similarly in Cork is that you have there was only one late maturing player in the whole system out of like 170 players, um, and I'll discuss that player in a second. So if you look at that for a second, you can see the major bias. Um, we're, when we're looking at a normal population about 15%, you've nearly 65%, um, and particularly at entry level there at under 14. Okay, so that's quite significant. I'm going to leave that for a second. And the Cork is very, very similar. So you'll see in Cork here, um, there's no late maturing players in Cork, um, and it's predominantly early maturing players as well. So in essence, what we're saying is, you know, this is this maturity bias that we have seen in other sports and possibly thought may have existed in Gaelic games is there and is there a very, very in a very, very strong way. And um, so that's maturity timing. Maturity status then is, is basically looking at where exactly they are in, in relation to their um to their adult height. But um that's the first part of it there. The second part that we looked at was relative age, which as I said I'm not going to touch too much on today. But interestingly enough, we haven't completely delved into this yet, but the relative age uh, effect that maybe Jamie would have found in development squads um, as being quite significant and I would have researched it about 10 years ago myself at, at development squad level isn't as significant here so you'll see in the even section at the end of each of those uh, graphs um, you know there, there isn't a huge one there are maybe the under 14s at the start in, in Kerry um, there isn't a massive uh, effect of, of relative age um, in this, so once again, it's 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 looking and showing us that maturity is a major one at this at, at these ages in particular, and that probably leads to the to the um, idea of when we pick our development squads and so on. So, last little bit or two here. So, just to kind of explain or I suppose um, articulate a little bit more in relation to how different relative age and maturity are. So, this is two, uh, pseudo names used here, but these are two players that are on the carry under fourteen team. And um, one of them, and what you found was one player was 95 kgs, the other player was 35 kgs. So if we took the it took the um, notion that's put forward a lot that you know this guy is born earlier in the year, so he'll be way more developed. You'll see that both of them are born later in the year, November and October. But the actual smaller guy, the less developed guy, is actually older than 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 the um, than the older guy. So Danny is is older than Mikey, and. Like it was it, when I was assessing, he did stand out at the, at the time. The coach, we actually spoke to him in a previous or in a subsequent studies, um, the third study I did, which was uh, focus groups with coaches, and he, he he gave a really good explanation around it. I didn't bring it up, but he brought it up himself around trying to mind this guy. He was extremely skillful, really a uh, good player, but he was tiny. He was absolutely tiny. But he had a, he, like when I showed him some of the information about his player, he was you know delighted to see that there's potentially a lot of um development from a physical perspective still to go. He won't be six foot five or anything, but ultimately um, his graph is going upwards from that perspective. On the other hand, then you have the other guy who's at 100% of his predicted adult height. So he's he's, he's the body of an 18 year old now, for want of a better word. So like you're really comparing, you know, men versus boys in that kind of context. 
So I suppose the question I'd have there is, like, who are you putting your money on to make it to minor level or to senior level? You can look at it two different ways. Like, the smaller guy is, is basically the only guy in the whole system who is, and he had a double disadvantage. He was both born at the end of the year and he was less mature. So he had to be extremely good to get into the system. And that's one of the key points about a lot of these late maturing players. It's harder. They're being squeezed out a lot of the time. OK, um, so that's that. So they're not the same as I, as I said there earlier. OK, they're different. And this is just one last little point before I hand, hand on to Des. This is just an example of how we, how we did it or an example of a full squad. So on your left, you'll see the information we collected. So dates of birth, date of assessment, the player's height and weight, and then their mom and dad's height. And what we were able to do is um, we can predict their height, OK? Um, quite closely, a, 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 a margin of error of about maybe 2.5 centimetres. Um, percentage of adult height, we can we can get obviously their normal age and their viral age age. So normally, I wouldn't even give that to the coach. I give them the player's name and I give them the percentage of adult height. OK, and we can discuss a little bit more about what players. Those in red are potentially going through their growth spurt. Uh, green are coming out the other end there. They've gone through their growth spurt. Um, look, there's loads of different ways I could explain this a little bit more, but if you look a little bit further, you can even see our own guy here in black. So that's that's the advanced 100 percenter there, and um, the guy who's coming in at a body of 18, even though he's 13.76, and uh, the other guy underneath him. So they're they're both in the same squad. Um, so that's just a little insight into maybe some of the information we, we could uh, we can show. So I'm going to pop pop you back onto this, and um, we'll come back in again at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona, for great research. Um, so I'm wearing two hats. <clears throat> One in terms of the Director of Coaching and Performance in Satanta, and also a part of the Gaelic Games Sports Science Working Group. And I see a few members in the group here attending, so thank you. Um, education, the most important thing. Once this is, is understood, once people are competent at this, it can bring so much to your coaching. It can bring so much understanding about the players you're working with. And the working groups with the likes of Fionn, Sean Cumming, we've some excellent information to share in the in the coming months, which I think will really benefit your coaching and benefit the players. And that can live in this, this learning space. So I'll share some information relevant to the talent uh, phase and also the club phase, F3, youth. Now, and uh, something I want to emphasize, I'm not going to go through this framework. This is the framework we use to develop players in Arsenal Academy. The key point I want to share is we'd four pillars. Basically, technical, tactical, psychosocial, physical, medical and educational. So this information, this maturation information, biological maturation information can can help with all those pillars, all those aspects. Um, improve our coaching, improve our science and medicine, improve our psych social, improve our education with a greater understanding of the player. And here's a, a, a little practical example. Uh, it's one squad. They're all the same age group. Uh, some players are 86 percent of adult height. Some players are, are 97 percent of adult height and there's variation in height, there's variation in weight and having this information can be really helpful. So another practical example, here's a, a squad I went on tour with to where I am now in Florida. When I got back, uh, I put on my lovely yellow raincoat, lined them up tallest to the smallest. And from that point on, I kept them in the same position. And I use this to educate the parents, the players, the coaches, everybody in the community. And so if I fast forward, the player beside me, Elijah, he's left because he's gone to Liverpool. He's doing well. But we can see now the players in the middle have started to sprout up. The players on the end have started to sprout, go through their growth spurt. The player who was the tallest, uh, Ishmael, is now the shortest. Over a short period of time, a lot of rapid growth with these young men and they continue to grow and gain muscle mass and pass me out. So huge amount of changes that we've to help those players through in this period. And as Fionn articulately showed and explained, some of those players go through the growth spurt earlier, some of them later, some on time 
And it's very useful to find out that. And it's very easy to do that. Now, this webinar is too short to go through the competencies of it, but it is quite easy to assess that. And here's what we used in, in Arsenal Academy, the under 14 squad. We all had this information. We all sat in a circle, uh, nutrition, psych, medical, physical, coaches, and we knew more about the players. So the first column is their height. Second column, their predicted adult height. That's quite useful. Then from that, we can work out their percentage of adult height. And with a couple of measurements, at least, we know how fast they're growing. So uh, research would suggest if players are growing at a fast rate, like there's a player there growing 11 and a half centimetres a year, they're more predisposed to overuse injury. So we don't change anything, but we keep a close eye on the player looking for more clues. And you'll see in red is the players in the middle of their, their growth spurt. Uh, the players in orange are approaching their peak height velocity. The players in green have gone past that. So we have a great understanding. And one player at the top there is 96% of adult height. Maybe we should be thinking of him as aligned with the under 15 players. Maybe they're more similar physically. The player at the bottom there is 86% of adult height. Maybe we should be thinking of him with the under 13s in more aligned uh, physically, a more fair comparison. And then we can make more informed decisions. So we reported that with all the age groups. It looks complex, but it's not that hard. And I can show you an example from a GA club in a moment. Another reason that it's really important is with some research, it has shown that the growth related injuries uh, like Osgood's in the knees, severs in the heel are more predominant during those phases. So when we know those phases are, we can keep an eye out and help manage those injuries. And the, some of the things we did in Arsenal was give information to the parents and to the players on what to do outside of the club. Because if we're managing their workloads in the club, and they go off and they play a lot of school sports, a lot of activities, do a lot of work, aggravate those injuries. Oh, it's going to be hard to, to manage them. So education for the parents and player is important. And we had little information pack on the typical growth related injuries that appear in these phases. So a case study, uh, we have these players, they're all playing professional football. At the moment, these, these are when the players were under 15. I think they're about 20, 21 now. This young man was it was 96% of adult height, approximately. 96% of adult height, 95, 93, 93. And then this young man was 92. And as happens in academies, it was time to decide, do the players stay with the club or are they released? Done in an empathetic way. There was a a multidisciplinary discussion about the player who was 92. He was struggling, he wasn't playing well, sometimes he couldn't train. So do we keep him or do we release him? The information on the table was, well, he's a lot less mature than the others. There's more to come and he's still powerful. He's going through about 18 centimetres per year of growth. He's adolescent awkwardness. He's finding movement challenging. So that was taken into context. And he was helped, he was supported, he was kept. They were aware he's a talented and powerful player previously, and he was helped through those phases. So if we look at this player over the long term, here he is at 12, here he is at 15, a little bit smaller than his teammates. They had gone through their growth spurt before him, but still a powerful young man. Then he suddenly grew. He got even more powerful and a very explosive young man. Now he started to pass out his, his buddies on the team. Massive changes, short period of time. He was helped through those. He got even more athletic, even more powerful, played for the first team, and he had a successful season on loan in Middlesbrough and is a very talented player. But without this information, he could have easily been lost to the system. Now, Yes, that's the Premier League. How can we do that in a club days? Well, here's an example uh, in F3 youth in Bishopstown, 
um, Satanta and Bishopstown have got together. Ian Jones there is an excellent strength conditioner that's coordinating all this. Brian Cuppert, uh, it was his brainchild. Uh, we've educated the coaches, we've educated the players, the parents on all that we're doing there in terms of health, well-being, performance, and we did test it. So all we had to get in relation to maturation was the date of birth, parents' heights, uh, the weight, the height of the young person measured properly, really accurate measurements. Uh, typically, in the general population, the distribution should be approximately 70% of players on time, 15% early developers, 15% late developers. Now, it's never as exact as this, but there should be some late developers, some early developers, the majority on time. What did we find in the under 12s, 13s? There's a good few early developers, OK? Not the end of the world, but a little bit of a, an emphasis towards early developers. We did the exact same as Fionn, uh, took the measurements. The Excel sheet worked out the, the maturation, the percentage of adult height. We could display this in terms of these pillars are the height of the player, and the red area on top is what their predicted adult height is. We shared the squad with the coaches like this. If you're in blue, you're an early developer. If you're in gray, you're an on-time developer. If you're in red, you're a late developer. So we should see a lot of gray, some blue, some red. And we can look at other things that we won't do now, like biological age, like map it against relative age effect. Um, but let's look through the other squads. So. A little emphasis in boys 12, 13s towards early developers. As they get older, oh, we've no late developers. A similar trend to county, different context, it's club. We've a lot early developers. As we go on, under 16s, under 17s, yeah, no late developers. Mm, lots of early developers, some on time. Now, why is this? I haven't got the answer. We're looking into it. We can hypothesize, we can discuss it later. Maybe those late developers mm, dropped out, didn't feel like going to the club training, were a little bit intimidated by the size. I don't know for certain, but it's different to county. You're selected in county. In club, you choose to come in the, the gate. Uh, girls, let's see what happened there. There isn't so much of a bias. There is late developers, there is some early developers, and there's a lot of on time. Just looks more like a representative of the normal population. What happens when they get older? It's similar. So this is, I find this fascinating. I haven't got the answer why. I haven't got the reasons for. I have thoughts, but if we need to investigate further. But what this tells me is that a good spread of normal population in girls at this participation level club, but we might be missing out a few early developer young men uh, in this environment. So maybe we encourage them to come back and the ones we have at the moment we look after and keep them playing Gaelic games. So this is what it looks like. Some in the girls, some red, some blue and a lot of grey. The boys. 14, 15 is a lot of blue. That's what it looks like. Early developers, the girls more evenly spread. So one thing I, I'd like to share from, from experience is I'm aware you're using Smartabase, uh, a very good tool. When I was in Arsenal, we used another thing similar called Sports Office. When you do gather this information, when you do add this information like heights, fitness tests, etc., this can make life uh, easier once that information is within there. Things like this, an overview of your squad, uh, looking at their predicted height, looking at their relationship to the peak height velocity, looking at their rate of growth, looking at their predicted adult height, percentage of adult height, it can be produced really quickly. Those fitness tests being uh, looked at quickly, the information being shared quickly, and we can't get into it now, but you can use that system to divide the teams into bio-banded games. So you could have a game of players between 85% of adult height and 90% and other games between players of 90 and 95%. And here's a framework we used for bio-banded games, but that's for the future. And finally, a little case study of what you can do now, pretty much. Measuring height accurately, you will have to do it twice. 
you might have to use something like the Frankfurt method. You will have to use a good steadiometer that's checked and double checked with a spirit level. But if you do measure height accurately and it's good to practice, uh, you can track the rate of growth. So here's a young man who's just before his growth spurt. Here's his height, 146 centimetres. He's 13 and a half. How is he moving? He's moving well. He's coached well by the likes of Paddy Roach, etc. Now, fast forward. He's further into his growth spurt. We've measured his height. His rate of growth has speeded, sped up. So if he's growing uh, two centimetres and you measure four times a year, every three months, multiply the two centimetres by four. That's equal to eight centimetres a year rate of growth, as an example. Now, he's growing seven centimetres. Um, here he is. He's still moving well. Our coaching, our program is going well and he's getting taller. Fast forward, he's 15 years, three months. You know now his rate of growth has slowed down. He's grown 20 centimetres since our first measure. Let's see how he's doing. Same guy, he's moving well. Good coaching. You've helped him through that difficult phase. Now we go further. He's 16 years, three months. He's grown 23.5 centimetres. How is he looking? There he is. He's moving well. And this is an example of helping a player through that growth spurt, monitoring each stage of the growth spurt, looking at different things like movement, strength, etc. And that's a young man called Nathan who's playing professional football in Bromley. So I think this information can be very useful, can add so much to your understanding of the player, can help with um, uh, managing the programme, uh, development, uh, and from a psychosocial side of it and a physical medical side of it, so many ways. Um, thanks, Des. Uh, I think that was, I suppose, brought the topic to life quite well. Um, that's like that's five to ten years of work there in Arsenal, which is brilliant. Um, but a lot of the stuff is on about, while it might be in a professional context, a lot of it is very, very easily producible, reproducible. And, and Des, I think, would be the first to admit that. Um, Basically, I suppose I want to I want to summarize as regards where we spoke about the topic a bit. We presented some of the research. What can we actually do about it? Um, I don't think we'll be able to like delve too deep into this tonight, and I'm going to wrap up on, on this in a few minutes. But to give you an insight into like that was was the first study of my PhD research, and we've worked closely with the coaches a good bit over the last year and a half, and it's quite promising really as regards where this information can go. And the one point I will make is that there's been doors open everywhere I've gone in relation to this. Coaches have been so open and um, people have been very interested in the whole area. So I, I do think there's um, there's quite a momentum, like there's momentum behind maybe supporting the area. But the first aspect and the first part to go on has to be awareness and education. So I, I barely call tonight education in so far as we're only scratching the surface, but very much, um, I suppose, the, the awareness aspect of like, you know, we found that there is a maturity bias. It's not probably that surprising. But we started working with the development squad coaches this year and on, on awareness already and education. So that was the first port to call. But what we found was from dealing with the coaches, um, they found it really interesting and I suppose they weren't surprised. Um, my third study, as I said, was focus groups. So we got to interview these coaches and they really went, we spent maybe an hour chatting to all the coaches to, to groups of them. So, oh, so I had five hours of, of chatting to coaches and it was just, it was brilliant to be able to harness some of their experiences and knowledge, but at the same time, they're, they're basically crying out for um, knowledge and information around the area. Um, but what we found when we spoke to the coaches was, and I'm going to show two photographs here in a second, but um, very much around club coaches being extremely important because they found that, they, they suggested that maybe there's, a, there's an, a maturity bias here already before the development squad start, because if you're doing trials, you know, your club is probably sending your top two or three players anyway, who are more than likely going to be your early matures. The same kind of exists at schools level and so on. So educating coaches on the ground at club level is the next protocol that we have to go with, that we're going at from the point of view of, of the group I've worked at. And I think it can be um, almost, uh, you know, it, it can be spread out from there to, to all the other counties and, and the other groups. But the club level coaches are extremely important here, not just um, we'd say development squad coaches. Um, the, the next part is the, port, the monitoring part, extremely important um, because you you can't, it's not as simple as looking out in the field and seeing a big or a small guy. I think that's what people think at times. You, you may be able to judge at times, but you want to be fairly experienced and know quite a bit about growth and maturation. 
Um, so monitoring is it's it's relatively straightforward to do. As Des said, once you're quite systematic on it, um, what I'm looking for them to do now is to assess maturation twice a year. Um, so once a player comes into the system at the start, you get your parents' information, you have their consent, um, you have their, their, their parents' heights, and from there all you need to do is get the players' heights and weights. Like you can get players' heights and weights in 20 minutes to half an hour before a training. So it's, it's not very time consuming. And the information it provides, in my opinion, is far greater than a lot of other things that you can be wasting your time on, or not wasting your time on, but the bang for buck is good out of this. Like, um, like as Des alluded to there, even the likes of monitoring, you can even use um, your fitness testing data and, and look at it in relation to predicted adult height. It's, it's, not, it's not that complicated and it's, it's most certainly a way more accurate way of looking at it. If we were comparing the two guys I showed previously um, in that slide, you know, comparing a guy who's at a body of 18 years of age and a guy who's at a body of 12 and a half. I don't think it's fair to be comparing them in, in, a fit, in fitness testing variables there. And, and that's unfortunately what we do a lot of the time. So that would be one of the things I would say in relation to fitness testing. Um, practices, so what are we actually doing? So in the last couple of weeks, we've started via bending with Kerry and it's in its very early days. So I'm not gonna say too much or even bias to kind of what's happened, but the feedback has been super really. It's been excellent from coaches. They've really enjoyed it. Um, it's quite interesting to see the differences between early maturing players playing together and with, we'd say late maturing or on time players. As I said, late maturing, there's literally no late maturing players in the system, but it's it's nearly on time or um, our early maturing players, but we were able to bend them. So at under 14 level with two of the teams, we went from 94% upwards. We had a, we had one group, um, so like coaches were say 20 players and they were asked to pick two teams of 10 aside and the same with, with, with another group of on time. Um, so that that's that's very promising and it could be something that we, we'd implement maybe uh, once a month or something as a, as a different outlet to assess players. But um, it's it's been quite interesting what, what's come from that and I'll, I'll share it, share it, all those results in time. Um, so another kind of one that has come up, which I found, so the more you look at the topic, the more you question um, or what we're doing and maybe some of the, some of the, you know, you, you look at it at a deeper level. And this photograph of the horse bolting, like I wonder is the horse bolt, has the horse bolted sometimes in relation to, first of all, the players were, were potentially selecting are from, uh, from even from, from um, Des's data there, are early maturers already from a club context maybe. And then, you know, the, the net is already kind of after tightening. And the second part of it is at 14 years of age, which is the entry level for development squads, this is when the majority of them are going through their their um their growth spurt. So I just think like there's almost it's it's a tricky time. Do you start the development squads earlier? I don't think that's the case. Do you start them later? But it's just such a really important time. That entry point at 14 level seems to be a really hard time to get it right. And from speaking to the coaches this year in the squads that I worked with, they actually kept the squads a lot a lot wider and a lot, lot um they kept the net wider for a longer period of time. And I think it's a far fairer way of looking at it. So just a small little caveat to that. So there's no silver bullet, but the, the, the starting point has to be around education, monitoring the second one, and then we can look at practices. There's loads of different uh, ideas there as well. Um, so just to summarize, there is a significant maturity bias. Okay, so some of the questions I might leave you with, maybe it might stimulate you as a coach. So you have to understand that relative age and biological maturation um, are two important constructs, but they're, they're not the exact same. OK, so they operate independently Um, you can be, as I said, the, the oldest and the least mature and vice versa. Um, we need to understand that maybe a little bit around the effects of growth spurt. Some of you have probably examples of your own kids at home. Maybe you've seen it. You can see teams you're involved in, but it happens differently um, for different people. But if you know the if, if you're monitoring and you know where they're at, you're going to be able to help you help them an awful lot more and understand a bit more about what's going on not just physically, psychologically, and um, there's an awful lot more going on there as well. So maybe even from a coaching point of view, I've used that photograph a few times and I like even sticking this last one in. Like, have we our heads buried at times sometimes if we're just looking at performance all the time? Like potential is a tricky one and I'm not even getting into the whole argument of what is a talented player, but maybe you can start to understand a little bit more around this when, when you're working here. How do we help players? What strategies are, strategies are we using? to support early and late maturing players and boy bending is a great example and um, we've used it so far once you once you have your your players information it's not that hard to to go about doing it um so um that's basically it um i'd like to thank my own research team um in ul mark and and phil have been excellent and 
Uh, obviously, it's great to have Sean as an international kind of leader in the whole area of growth and maturation. He's done a lot of work, obviously, in the Premier League. So I've got to learn a lot from a lot of his students and a lot of the, the contacts he would have in that area. So it's an interesting area. Um, I'm happy to share any more thoughts or ideas with anyone else. Um, Des is obviously a fountain of knowledge in the area as well. And there's a, there's a lot more to come in this area and we, we'll hopefully share it with you in time. So thanks very much. John and Des, thank you sincerely for a uh, fantastic, uh, very, very sharp and focused uh, and ener energetic and inspirational uh, round trip around tour, around uh, growth and maturation. Um, I think it's, it's, it showed from Des's pieces around the club uh, the, the potential um, implications or the implications for participation, for retention, as well as selection uh, as, as players come and, and bounce between club, school, club uh, and in, into development squads uh, if, if they get there, uh, as Fiona alluded to. So this was very much an awareness uh, session. There, as with every session we have done and are trying to do, there is going to be a, a, a forum, if you like, a survey sent out after this where we'd love to capture and gather any further questions that you that you might have um, for for us. Um, as both Des and Fiona alluded to, there is education um, being built in the background around this area and a lot of other areas that are going to be feeding into um, the, the learning space uh, over the next couple of months and hopefully the next couple of years. So for tonight, thank you very much for those uh, for those of you who got on the call and, and listened live. It has been recorded. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cut and edit and, and get it out to the, the community. Uh, a sincere thanks to, to Des and to Fionn for their time. Des over in the States, Fionn down in Kerry, uh, and to everyone to get, for, for getting on and giving their time. And uh, let's keep the, keep the conversation going. Hopefully it's, uh, it's going to provoke a little bit more thought, maybe some reflection. Uh, there's an open door. Between Fionn, Des, myself, uh, and I'm sure everyone on the call, there's a, there's a, there's a community of practice sitting there on the call at the moment uh, that, that are really engaged with this, and, and there's plenty more around the country. Um, finally, a shout out, and again to, to, to say there's so much of, of this, uh, or examples of this research uh, and, and work being done around the country in clubs and counties and schools. So again, the purpose of this series is to shine a light on that. Uh, to, I suppose, to, to rise all ships and to, and to better inform and support everyone. So thank you. Uh, have a nice evening.